I read getting ready for this series because I'm, I've been married almost 19 years, so I'm thinking, A, yeah, see, that's what you get from single people right there. It's like, so? Um, I didn't do that to get a big applause because I know it's like, big deal. Um, but maybe deep down inside, you're like, wow, that's a long time. And it is a long time, and it's a cool thing. But it probably disqualifies me from the series, so I feel like at this point I should just hand it over to one of you guys and say, you're there talking about this stuff like in real life. I'm looking at it from a, let's see if we can figure some stuff out perspective. But it's been a while for me since I've been on, a, on, a, on that kind of a date. You know, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going home with the girl that I go out with, and I'm not going to feel bad about it the next day because we're married. And, um, you know, so that pressure's gone. There's not, is it going to be a kiss at the end of the date? You know, all that stuff that sometimes you worry about. What if there's quiet? We like quiet sometimes. We'll ride all the way to where we're going in quiet, and it's not weird or awkward, and you're not going, oh, this is going miserable. You're just enjoying each other. It's part of being married and having a relationship that sometimes is about words and sometimes it's about just being together. But I, I don't know what I have to say, you know, about relationships. I went to read this book to try to figure out what's going on in dating. So I've been hearing about this book everywhere, so I went and read, uh, He's Just Not Into You. Have you seen this book? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. I'm going to summarize it for you, okay? Save you the money if you haven't bought it already. The basic premise of the book is this. It's written for women, okay? So guys, you're going to have another book that's going to come out, I promise you, in about three months. going to call, be called She's Just Not Into You. We just saw a little bit of that. And uh, so I'll save you the money for that one too. Here's the premise of both books, okay? Here's the premise of the She's Just Not Into You book. You heard about this book? The Sex and the City uh, writers got together and tried to figure out, well, they, there was a guy in a room with women. So that was problem A. And the women were talking about all these men that they have in their lives and what's wrong with them and why they don't call him back, and why if the date went so great and he said he would call, he didn't call, and why he gave me my number or gave me his number, took my number, took my email, gave me his email, and he said, I'll text you during the day tomorrow. I'm on a plane to Zurich, but I'll make sure and text you at the airport. And, you know, I didn't hear from the guy for like three weeks later. And then I finally called him because he never texted me back. And then I felt weird because I shouldn't have called him, but I did call him because I thought he probably lost my number. And if he'd had my number, he would have texted me, but he didn't have my number. So I got to help him know the number because he really wants to call me. And, you know, and then and, and he, he's jumping into their conversations. Here's the premise of the book. He's just not into you. And the idea basically is this, that guys know how to find the women that they're interested in. They don't lose their numbers. I mean, one in a million times that happens. And when it does, they call every person on planet Earth until they find the person whose number they lost. (laughs) Guys will call you back. You're like, you know, guys are this and that and the other. No, guys will call you. They may be trembling on the other end of the phone and hyperventilating and taking deep breaths and, you know, hanging up and then calling you back and hanging up and calling you back. But they'll call you if they're into you. They'll find you. And they'll actually enter into dialogue, possibly even a relationship with you if they're into you. So if they haven't done that, the reason they haven't done that is because they're just not into you. That's the whole book in a nutshell right there. It's easy, isn't it? I mean, it's brutal, though. I mean, have you ever sat with this conversation before and, you know, maybe been out two or three times and maybe been out for two or three months and finally the conversation comes down and she's sitting across the table from you and she starts telling you the whole deal and I've had a great time and I've never met anybody like you. And, you know, that's when you just can pack it up right there. As soon as you hear that line, you're like, okay, this is going to go downhill fast. And, and the time we've spent together has been amazing. You're an incredible person. You hear those three things in the same sentence. You're done. You're finished. You're about to get the hammer dropped on you right here and there. But you're going to feel good about it because you're going to hang on to that. Well, and then you're going to wonder, why did she say that if we've had such a great time together and I'm such an incredible person and she really appreciates me? Maybe she's just going through a hard time right now. And maybe, you know, if I just hang around a little bit more or no, By the book, when it comes out, she's just not into you is what she's saying. But at the end of the whole thing, here's the easy letdown. Are you ready? And and the premise of the women's book, by the way, he's just not into you, is that the hardest thing for a man to say to a woman is, I'm just not into you. Because he feels like the woman possibly could rip his eyeballs out at that point. And that's the greatest fear of all men, ultimately, is to be taken down by a woman. That's an innate fear of every man on the planet. And we know it could happen at any moment, anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. We could go down and stay down. And so the last thing you want to say to a woman is, I'm just not into you. So they say, well, you're an incredible person. 
I really love these few months we've had together, especially the part where you've come and cleaned my apartment and cooked for me and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you're such a special person. I've never met anyone like you before. I don't want you to think it's you. It's me. Has there ever been a more confusing conversation than that one? And if you've ever been on the other end of it, you want to believe it's true. And so you kind of think maybe there is something wrong with them. But you go home pretty convinced there's something wrong with you. And that's the dilemma of dating, I think. I, I think it's the dilemma of life, honestly, is that all of us are scared to death of rejection. And all of us crave more than anything else acceptance, don't we? I mean, that's why some of you are dating losers right now. You are in a big-time relationship with a loser. Is it, anybody here just want to go on record with that one? <laughs> Somebody over there? I saw a hand over here. I mean, if he or she's not here, you can just go for it. We're not filming this. Okay, I see it now. I, I got more people going now. Yeah, the, you, you are in deep with a loser. Your parents have told you she's not the right one for you. That didn't work. And so they said, we don't, we don't feel good about this. That didn't work. So they said, we think you need to get out of this relationship. We're concerned about you. Your father and I are concerned about you. That didn't phase you. So then they said something stronger like, as long as you're living in our house and living under our roof at 28, we're going to have to speak into this moment right now and say, you cannot see her anymore. Your best friend told you, what the world are you doing dating her? Isn't that the girl that you told me I'm not ever going out with that girl again? Is that not the same girl? Everybody around you is going, hello, wake up. But here's the deal. Acceptance is like a magnet that sucks us in, isn't it? And we will date a loser who accepts us rather than staying on our own sometimes feeling like nobody else wants us. Because acceptance is deep down in our heart what we all want, and rejection is what we're all afraid of. In job interviews, and in performance, in relationships, in academics, and athletics, and life in general, we are scared to death to fail and be rejected. And we want so much to be accepted that acceptance even coming from a bad source will draw us in. And we'll lean towards anything that says, I'll take you just like you are. And we'll rationalize, well, you know, I know he's not the best person for me, and I know our relationship's not that healthy right now, but he loves me just like I am is always the end of that conversation. It's like, that's true. I mean, I don't know that he loves you just like you are, but he has accepted you just like you are. And that's a, that's a strong pull for all of us. We're afraid to be on the other end of that thing when somebody says to us, it's not you, it's me, meaning it's you, and then we got to deal with it one more time. I'm a reject. And some of you have given up on dating. Some of you are right now in a dating hiatus. You're thinking it possibly may last the rest of your life, and you're, you've sort of signed off on that. I'm just not ever going out with another girl. I don't understand them. I'm never going to understand them. I'm never going to figure it out. I don't know the language. I don't know the culture. I don't know how to do it. Apparently, I'm a miserable failure at connecting relationally with a member of the opposite sex. So I think what I'll do, other than just have more people tell me it's not me, it's you, I think I'll just go to stay home by myself and love myself and accept myself and everything will be great. I'm dating me. Some of you have been dating you for quite a while now, <laughs> and it's not because there aren't any guys interested in you, and it's not because you're not an amazing person. It's because you're tired of being rejected, and you'd rather stay at home by yourself than have some idiot sit across the table from you and go, it's not you, it's me, to which you should just scratch his eyes out at that point and say... <laughs> You've got to come up with something more original than that. Now, this is free. This isn't the message tonight, but I'll just put it in right here. Let's, let's make a pact, okay? Let's make an agreement. You make an agreement because I don't have to make this agreement. Let's make an agreement together amongst yourselves that we won't ever say the phrase again, it's not you, it's me. And if you get to that point, just be honest and say, you know what? I'm a, I'm a dork. I'm just not into you. 
Let them scratch your eyes out. Let them be mad. Let them be angry. But at least let them go home knowing what the story is. And let's make one other agreement together before we move on. Let's, let's agree together to never say this to each other. Well, I feel like God... Okay, here's a guy who hadn't had a God thought in a month. (laughs) Wouldn't know God's will if it came down from a 14-story building and hit him over the head. But now I am convinced that God has spoken to me. So therefore, I'm absolved of all responsibility of telling you it's not you, it's me. Because God has spoken to me. God, that's, that's just lame. Let's just say that out loud. That's just bad. That's just bad news. That, that's, that's just not being honest and saying, you know what? I have prayed about it, but I don't have a clue what God said. I just don't feel good about it, and I'm out. And at least the person goes away going, all right. I can translate that to my friend when I get home, and they say, well, what happened? I say, well, God just pooped out on me. You know, I mean, he cracked up on me right there. I thought he had a brain, but he doesn't, and I thought he was, you know, I don't know who he was the whole time. I want to say four things to you tonight about uh, it's not you, it's me, which we're not going to use anymore, so that's out. So next time somebody uses that on you, just start laughing right when they get to it, and and I just want you to know that, just start laughing right there. Oh, let me finish this for you. I know. It's not (laughs) you, it's me, right? Oh, hello. That's fantastic. So original. Fantastic. Can I get everyone's attention in the Starbucks, please? (laughs) This guy... Just said to me, okay, George Costanza, all right, right here, sitting at the table, reliving the moment. You must have missed the series, bro. Just come on out with it. I'm just not into you. Say it with me. I'm just not into you. But I, w- I want to say four things about that. And the first one is this, and I want to start at an encouraging place because I know dating is a, is a scary thing sometimes. It gets scarier the older you get, by the way. Some of you guys are on the front end of this thing, and you're like, you know, Neil Clark warned, you know this guy, eHarmony.com guy? Anybody ever heard of eHarmony? He was on eHarmony. Anybody in here? A few of you? I'm just going to keep asking questions to see if anybody will go for it. Um, (laughs) How many of you have taken your eHarmony photos? Just, can we see a show of hands, anybody? Okay, there's one right there. I like that. Okay, so that's one out of 3,000. So I don't think eHarmony is really where you're going to find your match because there's not enough people in there. But Neil Clark Warren is the guy who got this thing off the ground. He says the average person, okay, now I, this, I, I, didn't, I wasn't average, okay, I, when I heard this, I thought I am defective, I thought I was already, now I'm sure I am. He said the average person dates 100 people before they get married. I started thinking, really? Okay, I think I went out with seven, okay, so. <laughs> and four of those weren't real dates, you know, and so, I mean, I, I, I was feeling like I'm dragging the average down, so some of you guys are like dating maniacs out there. <laughs> you must be going out five times a week, and you're pulling the average up, you know, you're doing, you know, 1,500 dates a year, and all the rest of us collectively who've had seven in the decade, you know, we're, we're sort of balancing out somewhere. That's a lot of, that's a lot of restaurants and movies, and what's your name again, and where do you work, and what are you into, and... Do you work out and what's your sign? I mean, that's a lot of that, you know. hundred of those. He, he, another source I found said that the average person has three to ten. That's a big number. I, I thought, you know, can we get more scientific maybe? Three to ten loves in their life before they get married. That married. The average seems to be somewhere between two and ten. I mean, real loves. And I don't know if that counts, you know, the sixth grade guy that you kiss behind the library at school, or I don't know if that's a, that was a big deal then, I don't know if that counts as one of them or not. It's a lot of stuff going on out there. It's a lot of relationships that don't work out. That's the way I looked at it. That's a hundred people who said it's not you, it's me. And that adds up over time. So I want to start with an encouraging thing. That's the first thing I want us to just wrap our hearts around tonight thinking about it's not you, it's me. You are a person of great worth and potential. I just want to let that land tonight. I want you to absorb that and breathe that in. That you are a person of great worth and potential. And the reason that I think it's imperative that we start there tonight is because, for one, we're scared to death of failure and rejection, and we crave acceptance 
And so being in that place, it's important for you to know that there is a God in heaven, and according to Him, you're a person of great worth and potential. To say it a different way, you are designed by God and desired by God. Now that's the beginning of of good dates right there. And that's the first step off the bad date train is to believe in your heart that you're a person of great worth and potential, that you're not just some rejected person who's been, you know, dumped on a hundred times before. It's not me, it's you so many times. You already know how it's going to go. You already have rehearsed it. You can feel it coming a week before you get to talk. But that you are a somebody that God cares deeply about. We shared this verse many times here, but it's from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. His words say this, that God has great plans for your life. His words say this, I know the plans that I have for you, and they're plans for good and not for evil. I I don't want to harm you. I want to bring you to a good place in life and give you a hope and a future. In other words, everybody in this building, it's not going to be up to Mr. You know, Joe Cool sitting on a stool somewhere who tells you, man, you're really somebody for you to really believe in your heart that you're a person of worth because we're beginning from the understanding that you were made by God, designed by Him, and desired by Him in such a way that He would pursue you in a relationship, an intimate relationship. God didn't just wind up the planet and send us on our way and say, figure it all out. But God has pursued us in history and connected us if we will accept his invitation relationally forever. And maybe you've been told all your life, I'm just beginning at square one, that, that you don't look right, that you don't, you're not the right size, that you don't have the right job, that you don't have the right social circle, that... You know, you're not cool enough or hot enough or hip enough or whatever. Maybe you're just not the, the magnet that draws people all the time. And somehow the subtle message maybe came from parents or a past relationship or some message of some boyfriend or girlfriend that's just played over and over in your heart and your mind for year after year after year. And somehow it's just pressed you down to a place of believing. One, I don't matter. And I'm not sure I'm ever going to really have a great life. I mean, if we were honest tonight, there's some people sitting in this building, and you've kind of come to a place where you might have even checked out a little bit and said, you know what, I used to be all freaked out about the marriage thing and finding the right partner and, you know, getting married and having a family and blah, 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 and all this stuff. I don't even think about that anymore. I mean, I do kind of in the back of my mind, but it's not really on my radar screen because I'm just not sure I'm ever going to have that kind of life. And it's important for you to hear and for me to hear tonight that God cares about us, that He knows the plans He has for us. Plans not to harm us, but to help us. Plans not of evil for us, but of good for us, to bring us to a place where we have a hope and a future. You're somebody, and I don't know if any guys ever told you that, but you are somebody worth a great guy. Somebody worth a great girl. You're somebody uniquely crafted by God, and you're so precious in His sight. And you're a person of worth, of value, of great value, so much so that God would desire you. Amazing that he designed you, but that he too would desire you. The second thing, though, is just stepping into reality, and it's this, that you're a work in progress. I want you to say that with me tonight. You are a work in progress. Why don't you say, I am a work in progress? Let's say it together. I am a work in progress. So we're not going to stop tonight and go, you know what? I'm a person of great worth and potential. I was created by God. I designed and desired by God. Woo, look at me. Now we're going to step forward tonight and go, you know what? But I'm a work in progress. In other words, God's not finished with me yet. A lot of people, and we're kind of in a church building tonight, so a lot of people think that God's whole deal is about heaven and hell. You know, that's God. He's sort of interested in the life after and the hereafter, and so his whole thing is, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? You've got to get saved so you can go to heaven. You don't want to not be saved so you don't go to hell. Hello, God is so interested in the here and now. And salvation is way more about what God does in our lives today than it is about where we go when we die. Oh, now that's a big issue where we go and we die. Don't get me wrong there. That's a, eternity is a long time, so long that it's not even time. That's a big deal. But God is not like sitting there going, let's see, okay, for 40 years, you're just going to have to figure it out. But when you die, it's going to be really fantastic. The angels are going to sing, and you'll be in heaven and glory, and that'll be great. Now, your life may just absolutely reek for the next 40 years. But man, when you get to heaven, whoo, that's where I step in and things get good. No, that's not God. That's not salvation. 
God is interested in the process, check this out, of you and me becoming everything that he dreamed we would be. God tonight is not preoccupied with whether or not you're going to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I'll tell you that right now. He is preoccupied tonight with how far you are on the journey of becoming the person that he dreamed up when he created you. He has a plan for you. He's got a future for you. He had a purpose for you. You're not just some kind of cosmological accident down here. You fit in God's economy. You stand out on the planet Earth, and God has a purpose for your life. The saddest thing in the world is not to sit home and not have a date or to go on a miserable date with some, it's not me, it's you guy. That's not the worst thing that can happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you would fail to reach the potential that God dreamed of when God made you. And you could have a thousand dates in between and still never become the person God wants you to be. See, we're works in progress. And when we step back and see that, here's the deal. It really isn't you, and it really is me. Now, this is the part where you got to trust me here. I love you, and I think a lot of you guys love me, so let's just have a big love fest here. But let's be honest. We've got hang-ups. And the consistent factor in all of your dating relationships, guess what, is... Who's been on every date you've been on? (laughs) And you can talk about Tommy, and you can talk about Johnny, and you can talk about Ronnie, and how awful they are, and how miserable they are, and what losers they are, and how they didn't get it. But guess what? You were the only person who was on all those dates. And if you're like, if you're the average, I don't know, I I would say for a show of hands, but I don't even want to go that far. If you're on the average, and you've got 100 dates going on out there, 100 relationships or whatever, different guys, girls that you're going to go out with, you're the, you're the variable that stays the same. You're the static constant. And so if it's not working out, here's a big fat clue. It might not be you. It might be me. You ever watch that show, What Not to Wear? The men are like looking up like, what? Hello? No, but you should. It's a good show. If you'd be married, you'd watch that show. (laughs) And really love it. You just absolutely love it. You'd watch it all day long. You'd watch a lot of things on E and Style Network. (laughs) What Not to Wear is really interesting because they go and find these regular people who are miserable dressers. You know them. And you know what I'm talking about? They got that outfit they wear like everywhere and they think it's like the outfit, you know, like here they come in the outfit again and you're like, oh my gosh, I wear that. <laughs> well, they, they find these people and they go to their house, A, and they go in their closet and throw all their clothes in the trash. That's the first thing they do. Then they get the person, any what not to wear people here, then they get the person in one of their outfits that they're thinking they're, they're styling, they're hot, look at me, I got the outfit on, right? And they put them in the 360 degree mirror room. It's awful. People, some of the people don't want to go in it. They'll just say, I'll do anything, throw all my clothes away, make me buy new clothes, I'll get a new wardrobe, I'll get an updated look, just don't make me go in the 360 degree degree mirror room because they put them in there, shut the doors, the camera's in there, and they see themselves all the way around. And now they're realizing, you know, there is extra, a little extra back there. You know, I was kind of thinking there was, but I wasn't 100% sure, and lo and behold, there is, you know, and, or you know, this, I don't look good from the back, you know, or wow, the part's not working in the back as well as it is in the front. And I mean, it's just like, it's that they get in there and they're like, okay, let me out. It's the whole thing of seeing themselves as they are. Everybody can see some of the things that are true about them. And whatever those are, we've got to embrace those things and, and get a plan of attack for them to say, God, I want to become. To here, check this out. The key to life is to become someone more than it is to find somebody. And some of you are spending all your energy trying to find somebody. And you need to start spending your energy talking to God about becoming someone, about his purpose for you. And to do that, you can, you know, you and I can look and say, well, I know I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't, you know, do that. But none of us can see our whole selves. 
That's why you have the side view mirror on your car so you're flying down 400 and you're changing lanes left and right because people don't know how to drive in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's always that guy that came down from coming, driving in the left lane, you know, all the way to downtown, going about <laughs> 12 miles per hour in the truck. So you're flying, you're weaving, you're changing lanes, and you're, every now and then do you ever get to that place where you kind of check the mirror and you don't see anybody and you're too lazy to look? Have you ever felt that where you're just, I just can't turn my neck right now, you know, I'm just too tired and so I'm going for it. But there's a thing called your blind spot over there and you're looking right in the mirror but you didn't see him there. That's the way our lives are. And so for us to understand two things, one, salvation is progressive. It does, it's not about where you go when you die. It's about how God changes you into the person he wanted you to be. And secondly, that that can't happen alone. You've got to be in a context where people can say to you, hey, it really is you. And if you want to not just quit annoying guys that you go out with, or not just quit driving women away, but if you really want to become the person God wants you to become, you've got to get in touch with these three things, or these four things, or some terrible cases, these 17 things, you know, or this, these two things, or whatever. And that's where you and I begin to step into the thing of going, you know what, it really might be me, and I'm going to stop blaming all the people out there and blaming men in general, which some of you have done. You've just written all of us off as, you know, I'm just done with men. You know, that just, I'll live without them. You know, I'd rather live alone, miserable alone without them than to live with these guys. They're just driving me crazy. Some of you guys have written off women. You've just said, I'm done, finished. But before you write off each other, maybe you just kind of get in that 360-degree mirror room and go, maybe God wants to do something in my life. 